Hey everybody, it's Karen Bryant. Welcome to the MMA Heat Podcast. I'm here with... Alan Joban, what's up guys? All right, so, um, you know, yesterday was a holiday and uh, we're doing this one via satellite because I know, you know, you were in the Valley training. Your fight is coming up in July. How's it going? Did you take one in the face? Alan, are you not keeping your hands up? Man, I mean, this is, this is, I don't know. I think guys at, at Bolt Wrestling haven't been trimming their fingernails lately. I'm going to have to get on them. There's nothing worse and a bunch of college grapplers coming in with long fingernails and scratching the shit out of you. But yeah, I was training. I got my two sessions in yesterday. Things are going good. Nice. Very nice. Well, we are going to talk about what happened at UFC Vegas. Of course, that's Cody Garbrandt's huge win over Thomas Almeida. We'll also uh, touch on the Hen and Barrow and his loss to Jeremy Stevens, some of the other things from the card. I do want to talk to you about... Um, the Conor Mayweather fight, uh, if, if you saw that crazy uh, poster, so we'll get into that and then also look a little bit ahead to uh, UFC 199. Um, you know, uh, we, we, Wade's leaving me a note here. <laughs> okay. Um, so he wanted me to mention that we have a new website and it's almost, it, it, he's still working on it, but Wade's been, you know, overhauling this whole thing. So if you do go to mmaheat.com, uh, that's where you can find a lot of our stuff in there. Yeah, <laughs> nice, nice. Um, we haven't backdated, put every single old video on there yet. That's going to take a process because we have like 2,000 of them. Um, but I don't know anything about MMA, according to some people. Just done that many videos but really i have it goes in one ear and out the other um and so uh so i heat.com check that out for sure um but you had a good holiday though alan i know you worked out but did you at least get a barbecue in later with the kids no, no barbecue no nothing but you know what i mean memorial day is a, is a day obviously that, that you know we right. thanks to you know we're, we're allowed to be in this great country but for me it, it's a day that i give thanks i do that but you know, as a fighter, you know, there's no, there's no go to the barbecue and have tequila <laughs> shots. You know, it's like, I still got to get my two sessions in. I still have to go and teach, you know, teach class yeah. or this and that. It was a normal day for me in that aspect of training right. and, that, and whatnot. But, you know, right. I enjoyed it. You know, it, just not having the L.A. traffic was holiday enough for me. Very nice. That's true. Okay, well, we are in round one here. Um, we, I was on the job at Fox uh, on Saturday and Sunday, so, you know, yesterday I did kind of relax. But what an incredible fight we had in the main event. And, you know, it's funny, Alan, we can go over this, but I had texted you before um, before the fight my picks, and I had actually picked Thomas Almeida, not because I don't think Cody Garbrandt had what it took to get it done. And it wasn't necessarily just because Almeida has a 21-0 record because, as we know you know you could pad fight I don't think he did but you know some of those fights who, who knows who, who they were and um I don't think it was that I just think that when we've seen in other fights with Thomas Almeida being able to weather a storm being able to like really even though he gets hits a lot be able to take it I just kind of thought okay well he'll be able to handle what Cody has and experience will take him through the tough times and ultimately he he would win but uh, but clearly clearly I was wrong <laughs> I thought the same thing. I mean, we text each other. We both had Almeida for our pick. Uh, shortly after I text you, me and my striking coach, Hulu at Saison, we were doing our picks, and he said the same thing. He said, Almeida's going to catch him in the first round with the head kick. Yeah. I said, man, the only thing I'm worried about is Almeida loves to stand in the pocket. He, he fights at short range. He takes a lot of damage. He has a good chin normally. So yeah. could he weather the storm of the or, – or could he weather the power, rather – of Cody Garbrandt, Garbrandt, and and Cody answered our question for us. He he, uh, uh, Almeida almost landed a couple head kicks, right. but they weren't really a lot of damn. You know, he was kind of like leaning off to the side, yeah. and uh, but Garbrandt, Whoa. he looked so strong. Right, he looked so strong, Whoa. and he just looked like not intimidated at the least bit mm -hmm. by Almeida's mm -hmm. size, and it made him push forward and have that performance that he put on. Yeah, he was great, and he really seemed to rise to the occasion. And um, I actually spoke to Uriah before the fight. We had him on the, the pre-fight show. The interview is actually on our MA Heat website if you want to look at it. But I asked him because what I'd heard – from different people was that the Cody Garbrandt we'd seen in fights isn't even the guy uh, in the gym. Like the guy in the gym is is performs even better than what we've seen. And obviously Cody's been doing a great job. So I asked uh, Uriah if that was a fair assessment. And he's like, yeah, the guy's a beast. We haven't even seen it all yet, you know, because sometimes he's a slow-ish starter, this and that. But to me, it seemed like on Saturday, dude, just like put everything together perfectly. And maybe it was also because earlier in the night, you know, uh, Aljamain Sterling and Brian Carey were, Caraway fought maybe it's because you know we know that we have the Bantamweight title coming up this weekend maybe he just felt that the occasion was right a lot of eyes on the division but he seemed to really rise I thought he did great yeah no you're right it, it was an op a big opportunity for him to 
to get his first main event. What is he, four fights into the UFC? Yeah, I think he's only got four or five fights in, right, first main event. First main event, four fights in the UFC, undefeated record. And like you said, he's got this big push, this big momentum built around him. And a lot of it's from not only his performance, but up until then, it was, it was you know, the guys that he trained with, the favors and all them, talking such good hype on him. And so when you have somebody like that, like Uriah Faber and everyone in that camp, talking this hype and saying, this is the next breakout star, this is the guy, yeah. it, it puts your eyes on him. And he went and he delivered, he capitalized on the opportunity. And I said it last time that he fought. I said, man, you know what? I was on the fence with Cody Garbrandt yeah. up until his last fight when he fought the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy and knocked him yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, joking you. Yeah, and I said, I'm sold now, but after this fight, 100%, he is a force to be reckoned well, with. Well, for sure, in that last fight, we got about a minute 14 left in this round. That last fight against Augusto Mendez, yeah, that was that was a last-minute thing, and you kind of expected him to have a good performance against him and dropped him. But, yeah, Almeida, you know, I think is is obviously so good that this is a really one of those things that should put him, you know, up in the rankings. And, you know, afterwards, we were joking. I even said it on the air that he was like, put some respect on my name, uh, you know, in the post. Right? But he's right at this point. You can't can't you can't you got to recognize this kid and he should be moving up the rankings big time he demanded it you know i want to say uh almeida is is so technical and has so much skill and he's got that fight that fight inside of him but he seems like somebody that if you took him and put him with uh and he might have this already but in my eyes i don't see it that he doesn't have like a strength conditioning coach i'd love to see his camp because his body still doesn't look as matured or as muscular Mm -hmm as strong as some of the other top guys in his division, especially when you look at him against Cody Gorbrandt. Gorbrandt yeah. looks so much thicker and stronger. And I think if he would incorporate that into his regiment, into his routine, that might help him because, you know, he had his guard up, but Gorbrandt was just going through his guard. I mean, right. he just he looks so skinny compared to him. I think he needs to add that. And, and on that note, the guys at um, Team Alpha Male, I see they've been... Yeah. That's how I'll just finish up. Yeah. The guys at uh, Team Alpha Male seem to team up... Um, with uh, a new supplement company lately. I can't remember the name of it, but, man, they're all looking in tip-top shape, yeah. especially Uriah Faber with his upcoming fight. He looks in the best shape I've ever seen him. Garbrandt looks really strong, so they're up to something over there, and it's working. Yeah, I get, you know, you're right, and it's funny because both those guys are only 24 years old, and, I want you know, we joke uh, sometimes about man muscles, but when do you feel like that you kind of clicked over from a from a young guy body to a grown-up body? I do feel that, like, you know, you know, me personally, I've always been a pretty kind of in shape guy. Yeah. But Pat Milicic, Pat Milicic said it best years ago. He said, "When you get in your late twenties, early thirties, is when you kind of fill out into your man body." Right. And I feel like both of these guys are going to be able to put on size. But um, um, Garbrandt, as I said, is already he's compact, man. He's strong. He hits hard. Alameda has the technique yeah. and the skills there. I think he just put a little more horsepower. Right. behind that it'll only amplify his, his fighting well that makes sense well as we get into round two right now here i want to talk about hen and burrell versus jeremy stevens that was the co-main event and uh great fight before this great. fight uh i had picked hen and burrell but i picked him partly because i liked the fact that he was going up in weight and his body wouldn't be depleted i think that as a former champion you you, you obviously are gifted and have a skill set that um that that's still there in your body. I mean, listen, TJ Dillashaw could just be the kryptonite. You know, I thought was he he was just the kryptonite because you can't win for 10 years or whatever. It's just TJ knows what's up. And, it, you know, that was harder for Hennon to make 135. Uh, and it was just a, a, a kind of a confluence of things. So I thought he was going to do better against Jeremy Stevens, who with all, everybody knows is a bigger guy coming down to weight. But I still thought, okay, he had to be fast enough to get off. I liked how he looked at 145. I didn't have problems with how he looked and how he moved. Jeremy's just incredibly powerful, and you could tell there were a couple times when he put Hennon on, you know, what street, and uh, and he wasn't able to really recover from that. But I don't think, like, people are like, oh, Hennon's done, he's done. And even before the fight, Jeremy had said that about him. I think he's broken. I don't think that's the case. I think Hennon is still a, a valid fighter, and I like him at 145. No, I agree. What's funny about this is I'm the fighter. You're the analyst. Yeah. You put so much real thought into this fight, whereas the thing that sold me on this fight, I picked Stevens, by the way, yeah. was the push. Man, okay. at, the weigh-ins, at the weigh-ins, when he pushed him down, I went, oh, shit. Jeremy Stevens is going to beat him in this fight. <laughs> <laughs> he looks so big. He did he look big. So and, and the way that he threw Burrell, Burrell was kind of, like, bewildered. but Burrell was kind of, like, like, what the hell, man? You just, like, threw me on my ass. It was like, you know, at the horse races when the horses come out yeah. and everybody kind of makes their final bet then. That was what it did for me. That's what sold me on it. All week they had been um, kind of promoting the fight and showing 
reminding you of Jeremy Stevens' yeah. highlight reel. And when you see his highlight reel, you're like, man, this guy really can put away anybody at any given time. And then the push kind of did it for me. And, man, it was such a fun fight. It was one of those fights where, like, it was kind of like every second counted. Every, yeah. every little, you know, the momentum would kind of shift here and there. Um, but uh, Stevens is a beast, man. He did it all. So, I agree. Burrell didn't get the win. Um, I don't think he's, like, never going to be the same again. I think they kind of figured him out. Everybody gets figured out. He went to a bigger weight division yeah. against a bigger, bigger man. Guy. It was a t- It could have been a bad matchup. Right. could have been, you know, a big, strong guy. But he'll be back. He'll be in there fighting, the, you know, make, getting wins over the top five guys really soon. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, in a way, that was a tough draw for him to get a guy co- who usually, who used to fight at, at 155 coming down. Granted, Jeremy's been there for a little while. Um, so, yeah, it could just be be sort of the luck of the draw. But, yeah, I don't necessarily think that Hennon's skill set has been depleted. And, you know, I guess it, if, if he's making 145 now, this is the lesson. Okay, how did I feel in the later round? How did I, you know, how did I perform? I'm sure that's a lesson for him. You know, afterwards, um, he just kind of said, oh, I don't, I don't know. You know, I'm not going to make any, like, you know, decisions or whatever right now. Um, and I don't know if he's the kind of guy who, like, if you're talking about Almeida, if Hennon necessarily wants to get any bigger because if he's had issues with cardio and endurance before, you know, right. I feel like we just need to find the right the right thing for him. But um, but I like Jeremy Stevens a lot, and the guy is tough as hell and durable. Like, dude has a chin, and uh, no, he's 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 fun to watch. You know, he's had some losses at 145, but the guy is really good. Super good, fun to watch the way he physically fights. But for me, I I love uh, emotional fighters, yeah. and he's such an emotional fighters. He wears his emotions on his mm-hmm. sleeve, and he fights that way. He fights passionate. And uh, you got to respect him for it. It was, it was a great effort, great win. Props to him, man. For sure. And with a, mon- a minute left in this round, I want to ask you about something. Because during the interview that he did backstage with Megan, he was saying that Hennon's team was mean mugging him. And he kind of walked off. Like, have you ever had, because after the push on the, at the weigh-ins, like, have any of your opponents ever tried mean mugging you? You know, you know what I mean? The whole night? Does that bother you? Or does that set you off yeah. more? It definitely fires you up. I get, I get it. Uh, when I fought in Brazil, Worley Alves... Yeah same thing he was a guy that everywhere we went in the airport at the hotel for breakfast we're eating breakfast and he's mean mugging me and i'm like save it for the fight bro like how what are you wasting this energy four days out but uh some people respond differently i responded and obviously jeremy stevens responded in the correct way where you take that and you just you, you let him have it the day of the fight and that's what he did yeah it's interesting because we were talking about that like yeah is it emotionally draining should you you know, now you're worried all night. Oh, he pushed me and this and that, and you're 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 distracted by a mean mugging when maybe you should be like mentally resting and stuff before. So, just curious, you know, if that had ever happened to you. But. It's true. It always reminds me of the expression like, "Oh, I didn't lose any sleep over it," but you did but a you lot. Did. Of, yeah, because you pushed him, he pushed you. Instead of going back to your room yeah. and getting some Pedialyte or recovering and relaxing, you're sitting there thinking about what happened, wasting energy tweeting, talking to your coaches, and it's just wasting energy. You're losing sleep. You're losing relaxation time. It's uncalled for, but that's how some people fight. I like emotional fighters inside the cage, not outside of the cage. Yeah, well, plus we were seeing, like, in that respect, sometimes it's nice having that language barrier because, like, I feel like partly it was all on, on, on Stevens. Like, I don't know that Hennon and his guys were as upset about it. Like, sometimes just not speaking the other guy's language. I mean, maybe he was bummed out about the push, but... Uh, it seemed like Jeremy was more fired up emotionally uh, after all that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I felt it was almost like there was more riding on him being Dominic Cruz's yes. teammate. Him, you know, him being the former champ fighting Steven. Stevens is kind of like, I need to put my foot down and be the guy that says, look, you're coming to my division. I'm going to show you how it is. And, and he, he did a good job. Yeah. He did what he wanted to do. No, he did. Absolutely. Well, speaking of your division, Alan, here in round three, we're going to talk about a couple of the uh, welterweight matchups on there. And, you know, I always feel like when you're watching these, are you like, yeah, yeah, good fight, bro. Yeah, good fight. That's good. Not too good. Don't get too good. You know what I mean? But when I look at somebody like Rick Story, who who is a good fighter, who you know has has had some uh, some injuries, and so he's been out of the mix a little bit. But every time he comes back, you're like, oh yeah, that's the guy who you know beat Tiago Alves, who's a, who beat Gunnar Nelson. You know, he's a really really tough guy. Um, I thought that was a good fight for him. You know, but I I um, you know I know he's got the neck injury. I thought with Safadine, it was kind of unfair. You know, the guy almost. Had to pull out of the fight on Monday because of the, the the cut on the knee and stuff. And I felt like, well, that sucks. Like if I knew my opponent had this injury on Monday that maybe put him in jeopardy of the fight, like all I'm going to do is aim for that. And I feel yeah. like it, it kind of sucked for Tarek to have to go in there with that with that you know injury. 
Yeah, I, I was unaware of the whole yeah. the whole injury. It was news to me when I was watching it live. But you could see blood was dripping down the knee. It was so it seemed in my, in my eyes more than just a scratch. I've I've you know done I've scratched my knee on the concrete yeah. before, and then right away it opens up because it's a scab. Yeah, this was like this is like something that possibly needed stitches. No, there were and, stitches. That's the whole thing. Is that like they like popped out? That's what I that's what I assumed that the stitches must have broke or it yeah. probably was something like stitch because. For that much blood to be dripping that early, and you saw what happened. His knee hit the it hit yes. the the ground right away. Oh. It opened up, um, yeah. but he never hesitated. Tarek's um, a guy that I've trained with in Sparling. Oh, yeah. He's a he's a really good guy. Uh, I really I, li I like him. He's a really good training partner because mm -hmm. he's very technical and he has under. I think they mentioned it in the broadcast. He has really underrated wrestling okay. um, coming up in the camp that he came at with Vincent Henderson. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, never, Dan Henderson right. for so long. Um, but yeah, I, I was really. I can't even remember who I picked. If it was Story or Safradine, who did you pick? I think in this? we picked Story. We um, both picked I'll have to, because that was the whole thing. Is like even though he's been gone a while, um, you know he is a really tough guy. And like I said, when you look at who he's beaten on his record, and mostly it was because of Safradine's injury. Because the truth of it is, is I think he's terrific. And if you saw the pictures afterwards, he showed uh, Rick Story showed like his leg is just eaten up. I mean, Safradine oh. is so good. So in another in another situation, had that injury not been there, I'd probably you know. I, it was still a 50, that was a closer to a 50-50 fight for me, you know, and I liked Eric a lot. Um, yeah, you went with um, Almeida, Stevens, Safadine, Kamozi, Larkin, Felder. You did better than I did. Cause I, <laughs> I picked the two Brazilians in the front. Like I said, I, I had my reasons. Uh, I did Almeida, Barral, Story, Miranda, who choked yeah. uh, Larkin uh, and Felder. So, you know. Uh, we we did okay. I am curious about your uh, your thoughts on Lorenz Larkin fight because I'm a bit, that one was a tough call for me because I think Jorge Masvidal is awesome and there's been a lot of times when he's had these close fights and they haven't gone his way and I feel for him because he's a good fighter and he's a, he's a well, he's solid you know um, but I don't know if if, if uh, you know I think Larkin won. I did have it going to him. I agree. Yeah, I agree. It, it was it was the right decision in my eyes as well. Um, Jorge Mazadol, he's a tough guy to fight, and he does this thing that it's 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 hard to explain. But I call it sometimes. When I tell my students, I say there's like the jujitsu guys say the invisible jujitsu okay. things that it's not really a technique, but it's a pressure. This is the same thing in Muay Thai, like an invisible pressure where where just body language. You take a kick, and instead of the, your arm flying and it looking bad for the judges, even though you blocked it, you go mm -mm, nothing happened. And he does that kind of thing. Jorge Mazadol, when he gets hit, it's a it's a hard shot. He got hit a couple times with a hard yeah. right hand. And what did he do? He just smiled. Nothing. The ties do this in Muay Thai. Yeah. The, the ties and Muay Thai. And, and so it makes you think, oh, you know what? Maybe that wasn't maybe that wasn't a big hit. And he gets right back in there. As soon as he gets hit, bomb, he'll throw a jab. So he's playing this kind of invisible fight game where it's like, I'm deflecting the energy, I'm deflecting what seems like it hurt me. And even though it may have hurt him, I'm not letting people notice that, and I'm coming right back with something. So it seems like he's still in the fight, mm -hmm. and his fights seem a lot closer than they are. Um, but he's really good. He's really good at what he does. And I think Lorenz Larkin is one of the most explosive strikers in, in the division for sure, in the welterweight division. And so for Mazadov to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and stalk him down the entire fight, yeah. I thought that would be really impressive. But getting back to it, you said it yourself. Mazadol does this thing where he's in these tight decisions and it doesn't always go his way. And he's got to find a way to get around that, to do something bigger, not to take the impact and kind of persuade the judges by smiling, but maybe coming back more forcefully rather than letting it always go to the decision. And he's a guy that can put people away, but he's going to the judges too often yeah. and it's not going in his favor more often than none. Well, and I just um, got I want to hold this up because I might have screwed up the clock, Wade. Sorry. Uh, but um, I, actually, what I heard too is that. Um, he Masvidal's even had meetings with refs and judges because of the because he's been burned, smart, and smart he was like, dude. "What can I do?" Because you know, I, I think obviously the frustration is there, and and maybe it was yeah, like just that aggression level, kick it up a little, kick it up a little more. Um, one thing I do want to ask you about: where the McMahon I fight? Do you think that uh, Jessica I just? underperformed because she and Sarah McMahon had been sparring partners before because she said after the fight, oh, I guess I just kind of hesitated because I feel like she knows me so well. But I'm thinking, listen, sister, at this point now, she's one in four in her last five fights. She She's I... now on a three-fight skid. Like, if I got two losses behind me and I'm fighting, I don't care if you're my babysitter, I'm going to go in there and try to blast you. 
you know? So I, that was a tough loss for her and a, and a, and a bad, bad loss, I think. Yeah, yeah. Man, I didn't realize yeah. that Oscar, who was somebody who was at the top of division not long ago, is now on a three fight skid. That's that that's that's amazing to me, man. Oh, uh, and I didn't. Let me ask you this: Am I, am I wrong? Did did I ask for this fight? You know, with that, I'm not sure. Um, I know, like I said, they had trained together before, and I know, you know, both of these girls are trying to get on the on the back to for Sarah back to a title shot, um, and they've just had a tough go of it, and and uh, so that I'm not sure if they asked for. It. I think it's just at this point, you know, the matchups are there uh, when you're talking about the girls at the top, and it's funny because afterwards Sarah asked for a, a title shot, and she was like so polite about it and stuff. I don't know that that performance um, earned her one yet. You know, Sarah Style being an Olympic wrestler you know, that's that's her bread and butter, and I understand that, but it's not going to convince me, oh, my God, she needs a title shot over somebody who's more likely to let th- let their hands go. Um, yeah. But but a good win for Sarah. But, I, you know, for somebody, for Jessica, that night when you were fighting in Vegas, uh, I mean, in uh, L.A. that time when Ronda was fighting, you know, um, and it was such a big... It was such a big deal uh, backstage. Like Jessica was so fired up. She did a scrum and everything. And she was like, I'm putting the division on blast and this and that. For somebody who had so much uh, confidence <laughs> a, a little while ago, I don't know yeah. what's happened to her. Um, so hopefully she gets it together because she's fun to watch. Uh, we are in round four now. I do want to talk about, um, <laughs> oh, my God, Alan Joban. Have you seen the poster for oh, Mayweather man. versus Connor? Now, I- I've downloaded that same app before. It's free. You can download the phone. (laughs) Seconds to do it. Exactly. (laughs) So silly. Um, You know, I I guess Floyd tweeted it the other day, and of course the internet loves to explode. And it's like, who the hell thinks this? It says Mayweather versus Connor. Like, really? That's how they're going to sell a poster? And the most janky, you know, like, all they have it, so low rent looking. Um, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on, on all this talk and whether or not you think it would ever happen. But uh, just this constant going back and forth about Connor fighting Floyd Mayweather. Karen, honestly, I don't even know anymore. It's like, it's like, it's like they, I, I almost feel like both of these guys make a lot of money and they both know that they can somewhat control their sport because of the money that they bring in. Right. And so kind of, it's like a power thing. It's like, you know what? Let me just play with it, see what happens. I almost feel like let me tweet this. Yeah, Maybe exactly. somebody comes up and offers us a hundred million dollars, like we said, and then hey, then we'll fight. But until then, I don't see it happening. It's just, it's just so unrealistic. I mean, you saw in the video, Connor is a great striker in MMA distance at the game of MMA. Put in close boxing distance against boxers, he's going to get destroyed. He was getting beat up against a sparring partner who I didn't know who he was. Mayweather would destroy him in a boxing fight. I would still watch it. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd pay pay per view. I'd probably go to a bar or something. Yeah. But um, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. But they're just having fun with it. And, and that poster was so, so so bad. Yeah, it was so bad, man. I could. It's so watch. bad. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's fun to talk about, and I think. You know, it, it's fun to engage those two audiences and to and to build the guys up. But yeah, I don't think. Listen, we know how good Floyd is. I don't think anybody's gonna go in there. That's that. You know, obviously we know. Like our friend trains Pacquiao. Like if Pacquiao couldn't get it done, uh, you know, um, you got to be able to find Floyd and you got to be able to hit him to to knock him out. And it's just so difficult. Um, but I I still you know like. I love Connor's moxie. Like I, I, I love that he has everybody talking about it, and that he just, like you said, he's sitting back there laughing. And, and who knows, like if they came up with all the money and said, listen, even if he went in there, was like, whatever, I'm gonna lose maybe to the greatest boxer of all times, but I'm gonna make fifty mil while doing it. Like I say, have at it, but I don't ever think it really would happen. But damn it, like you said, if it did, I mean, shoot, I'd be there. And just to, just to end on this. I love the way that they're meticulously – Connor's Instagram, he he, fo- he takes pictures of these boxing Reebok shoes that right. he just got. The next day, he, he's boxing. He's he, Everything's bo- – he got new glove, right. boxing gloves. It's like, it's like they're dropping these very unsubtle hints as if this thing is happening, yet it still seems a million miles away. So I don't know what's going on. Well, also, you know, the other thing about it too is whether or not – they could because the UFC doesn't usually co-promote. You know what I mean? They're not going to lend out their biggest star. What if he gets hurt? 
Um, right. Something like that. So, you know, the, the, the mathematics of it and the money behind it would have to be like this whole other thing. But I do, I, the one thing I don't like about it is I want him to, and I think he is focused on his training, but I, I want him to, you know, come back and fail, defend the belt. Um, you know, I know we're going to have an interim uh, in July, but like, I still want to co- see Connor do, do Connor's thing, like where he's actually great and, you know, fight the people that we want him to fight, fight the guys that are waiting in line for him that deserve that chance. Um, so that, that's the only part of it that I don't like, but I love, I love the tweets where he, did you see the one where he's all in white? And he said it takes like a, a something sack and a fat wallet to rock all white. And know this, <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> like, yeah. I think he's awesome. I think I think he's hilarious. I think he's great at keeping us talking about him. And for that, I I'm, I think he's just a lot of fun. He, he took the fast track to success, and now he's only interested in big money, yeah. exciting fights. He's not thinking about let me who's next in line to, to fend the belt. Yeah, he's thinking about what's the most money, what's the biggest event possible. And I get it, you know, he's about the money right now. It's true, but I'm guessing, you know, if you're if you're Frankie and you're Jose, you're just just hating it, right? Yeah. Just hating it. Yeah, Frankie's going to have to start talking trash, or whoever wins yeah, is going to yeah, have yeah. to amp up the, the shit talking. Right, right, right. Well, as we actually close out this round, between, between rounds four and five here, who do you think is going to win that fight, Jose or Frankie? I mean, I'm a, I, damn it. Damn and it. you don't have to answer, but it's I know. Like... And, and, and I normally, I normally would go with Aldo mm-hmm. just because I love his style. Yeah. But um, I feel like Frankie. It's just sometimes you feel like people have the time that they're. Right. It's their time, and I feel like it's Frankie's time. That one's so hard. We were talking about. Yeah. Go. Okay. You're going. You're going out. Great. It's it's so hard because we were talking about this, and you know, as that fight gets closer, it's something we'll talk about too. But it's like. You know, Jose may be gun shy because of what just happened that last time, but at the yeah. same time, his gun shyness, the possible gun shyness, is counterbalanced by the fact that he's going in there against a guy he's already beaten. You know yeah. what I mean? So, like, I would think that that would add to the comfort level and kind of maybe make that a push, but they're different fighters. You know, it was such a close fight the first time I was at that one. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm excited, but yeah, that's going to be uh, that's going to be tough. But as we head now into round five, uh, let's look ahead to UFC 199. First and foremost, are you going to be there? Oh yeah, 99 LA. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm so excited about this card. Some great matchups. I will be there. Nice. So they did they give you good seats or? I don't know. You know, it's funny. I, I'm waiting to hear back. The UFC said we're waiting to get a confirmation from Dana. I'm like. I just want some freaking tickets to the fight. <laughs> what yeah. do you need a confirmation from him for? You have to sign off on it? So right. I don't know what's going on, but hopefully they're good seats. We'll see. Well, shoot, I would. I, we could have put you in for a credential as the MA Heat team. You could have <laughs> Go in there. You could have come with us, but yeah, no, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be great. I know tomorrow, you know, we're doing this show on Tuesday. Tomorrow they're gonna have open workouts and all that. But uh, I'm curious, who, you know, in terms of the rivalries. You know, do you like the the, the Uriah versus uh, uh, Dominic rivalry more, or the Bisbing Rockhold rivalry? Well, they they're like different rivalries to me. Um, Bisbing will talk shit to uh, a cow. Right, I mean, that's I, what I was saying it's Bisbing against the world. It almost doesn't matter. He doesn't care. He will talk shit to anything. Um, so it's fun. It makes it intriguing. And look, he's doing his job in this effort. He's already got. Let's see, he got kind of demolished the first time that they fought, and now he's getting called on short notice against probably the best Luke Rockwell we've yeah. seen. So it, it's a tough fight for him, but he's making it intriguing. It could be saying it's his time, and we'll see what happens. But I've got to go with the, the Faber Cruz fight. There's just too much history there. And again, talking about, I don't know why that's my theme today, but being your time, mm-hmm. I think Faber is going to do it, man. I just you feel do. like I feel like Faber is going to get it done. And and I've got so much respect for Cruz. I got so much respect for all four of those guys, what they've accomplished inside the octagon and what they've accomplished outside of the octagon. I really look yeah. up all four guys. But I feel like Faber has he's gonna finally bring the belt home to Alpha Male. You know, again, these little videos keep selling me, but there was a, a video of Uriah Faber shadow box the yeah. other day. He looks so crisp. He looks so sharp. He looked like a professional boxer. His body was shredded up. Right, right. I'm just, this is his time, man. He he finally put uh, all the equation together, and he's gonna get it done. Wow. Counter that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um. You can't go against Cruz. You're gonna have. I, 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 <laughs> you know. Um. I. I actually. I. I'm. I'm saying Cruz. Um. Okay. 
It's okay. Play it safe, baby. No, 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 no. Because, <laughs> because, of the, because I, I agree with you that I think Uriah is looking amazing and Uriah is, you know, is, is incredibly talented. I still just think, you know, Dominic is just still too hard to hit. I think he's too hard to find. Um, <sighs> he still has his number, you think. You know what I mean? And I feel like, I also feel like the mental game, like, I know how people are like, man, like, failure is just not an option. But, like, literally for Dominic Cruz, like, I literally think his body will refuse to lose to Uriah Faber. Like, I just don't think, do you know what I mean? I I think you have to take a gun in there. Like, you know what I mean? I don't know that, uh, that, that, yeah. Well, listen, Faber submitted him before. I guess that's what I love too is that it's the trilogy, um, and they both know that the other guy is is beatable and that they can do it. I don't know. I just feel like if you're talking about it being Uriah's time, that's the storyline for me with Dominic when he got his belt back. Like I feel like all that BS he went through and being out of the game for so long, I felt like that was that was like the, the penance for the greatness that he that he's er- earned. You know what I mean? 100%, 100% agree. Like I said, my respect for Cruz comes what he's done inside the octagon, outside of the octagon, like at Fox and everything, but also because of the layoff, to go through two ACL surgeries and a third knee, I've had my ACL surgery. And in most sports, ACL surgery is career ending. Right. The average NFL career is like three years long. Right. This guy went through multiple knee injuries, you know, NFL surgeries, and, he, and he's coming back and still fighting and winning the belt. Like I, I think it's inspiring. Yeah, it is. A Cruz fan after the after the comeback, then you're not then then you shouldn't be watching it because that is a true a true story yeah. of grit and determination. Um, that's why I'm a big fan of Cruz. Right. I just think that man, Faber is just looking crisp, he's good, crispy like a box of fried chicken, and I think he's gonna get the job. All right, well, oh, hey, you're entitled to your opinion. One thing I yeah. I wanted to ask you out uh, as we almost uh, finish up here is um you know a lot of people are saying oh Boozman you know he's coming in on two weeks notice he's gonna get smoked. But there is something to be said for the fact that, you know, Michael, he's been working on his cardio while he was up doing his movie and stuff, but, like, Rockhold's body is banged up from that camp, from, you Mm -hmm. know, the work that he does up there with DC and Kane. Those guys don't play around. You know, they work hard, and there's something to be said for Michael having the fresher body coming in here. You know what? It's like he didn't forget how to fight while he was off making a movie. And if anything, in a way, he could come in with a body that just feels way, way, way better than Luke's does. And like he, you know, how they've been going back and forth. How and Mike's like, look, I got you in the first round and yeah, you got me secondly. But um, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not saying that's a gimme for Luke by any stretch. You, you hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Uh, long training camps are, oh man, they do a damage to your body. And we all know that that camp, especially yes. over there at AKA, they're known for being banged yes. up. I think he said his last camp was the worst camp right. he's ever had his fight against Wyman. So we don't really know how banged up Luke is, and I agree 100% what you said um, um, for, um, for Mike. Mike, thank yeah. you very much. For Mike, sometimes you get that short notice. Mike said it himself. He said, you know what, sometimes I'm in an eight-week camp, and four weeks into it, I feel like, man, if I fought right now, I would be so crisp. Right. And I get the same thing all the time. Right now, I feel I feel awesome. Sometimes the, the extra four weeks gets you to polish a couple things off. Sometimes you get injured. Who knows? But if he's feeling confident and sharp right now, only two weeks out, he stayed in shape. There's always a chance. There's always a chance. I think Luke was so superior to him the last time. It's hard to see it going any other way. But I agree with what you said. We don't know how banged up he is and how fresh Michael Bisbing is. Yeah. Well, well it's gonna be it's gonna be heart attack night for the. Uh... For the Fox team, you know, um, uh, I like, you know, there's just so many great fights uh, all around on that card. So I'm, I, I'll make sure I'll, we touch base when we're at the show. But, you know, wait, not, we'll get there early in the afternoon uh, and have our, all of our uh, MMA Heat coverage, which, again, we'll be putting up on our uh, newly re- redefi- redesigned uh, MMA Heat website. Alan, where can people find you on social media? Uh, same place. Uh, Alan Dash, Joe Band, yada, yada, yada. Uh, at, at Joe Band, hit me up. Uh, and like I said, check out the new MMA Heat website. I checked it out. I love it. I go to it every day. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Karen Bryant. Uh, same with on YouTube, on Instagram. I'm KB Heat. And um, uh, that's it for now. Um, so thank you guys so much for checking this out. Alan, keep your hands up in your training for Nordine. And uh, and stay focused. We'll see, we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. We'll do it. Peace, guys.